Good morning. Hi, everybody. Good to see you all. How are we doing? Good? Good. Okay. So as Richard said, we are continuing our series as part three called Transformed, where we hear stories and we look at examples in the Bible of people who've had encounters with Jesus and they've been transformed by them. And today we're looking at the issue of disappointment. So have we got any diehard England rugby fans out there? Because if so, this is the word for you. <laughs> what about uh, my South African brothers and sisters? Yeah. Woo-hoo-hoo. Go Baka. <laughs> what an amazing, amazing result. I was going to watch the game with um, some South African friends. When I was, um, I took a gap year before I went to university and I lived and worked in South Africa for a year and I traveled around it extensively and I kept going back. I love South Africa. It's a bit of a part of me. And I knew I'd end up marrying a South African man and I did. I married a, a surfer from Durban, met him in London working in the TV industry and he was a massive Springboks fan. I talk about him in the past tense because he's actually in heaven now, bless him. And I do wonder if he knows. Does he know his team has won? Does he care? Probably not. Um, too busy worshipping, too busy having an amazing time. Anyway, um, but one thing, there are lots of things. I was dealing with lots of memories, lots yesterday as we watched the match. My three sons are all now South African supporters. Before the game, they weren't quite sure (laughs) because they're half English, half South African, of course. And, um, And I saw Cyril Ramaphosa and I heard that he'd spent time with the team before they went out on the field and he had a big speech with them and he really got them going, got them ready to go out. And I did think at the time, oh my gosh, England have got a fight on their hands. Of course, South Africa were the underdogs. And um, as I saw Cyril Ramaphosa, it reminded me of the time that I met him. I worked for BBC News and I met him at an event before he became president of South Africa. He was a president in waiting. He was head of the ANC at the time. And Jacob Zuma had not yet left. And I had a chat with him and I remember saying to him at the time, I was conveying the weight and the weariness of all my South African friends and family of how tough the journey had been and how disillusioned they were with the leadership in South Africa and how does he, ha- does he have a sense of that weight of responsibility as he comes in to be president of South Africa? And I sort of looked at him in the eye and I went, do not let them down, I said. <laughs> and I think he was looking around for security and desperate for someone to move me on. But this is a- uh, I wanted him to hear that message. And yesterday when I saw him celebrating with the team, I thought, this is a big moment, Ramaphosa. You need to capitalize on this amazing moment for the Rainbow Nation. So let's see what happens. Anyway, congratulations. So let's start in Luke. Well, we're actually focusing on Luke 24, verses 13 to 35. Let's read this together. If you have a Bible, turn to it. If not, it's on the screen behind us. So now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you only a visitor to Jerusalem and do you not know the things that have happened in these days? They're amazed because three days prior, Jesus had been crucified. He asked, what things? About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it's the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb, found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. 
Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he was going to carry on, go further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and he began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and turned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognised by them when he broke bread. So you may have read this story many times. I certainly have, but I haven't really looked at it in any great detail until I prepared for this morning. It's, it's one of the accounts of Jesus appearing to his disciples, his followers, after the resurrection. So this is the third day. This is the first ever Easter. And this encounter took place sort of in the afternoon, early evening. So Cleopas and another were on the road to Emmaus. It says they were seven miles out of Jerusalem. And they were busy discussing all that had happened. And there was a lot to talk about. There was an awful lot to try and process, try and get their heads around. Three days before Jesus had been crucified, the horrific, shocking, appalling event is something we sing about all the time in church. It's something that we focus on every single Easter. But I think if we're honest, we can get a bit desensitized to it and it's power, can't we? For these two men, this absolutely life-changing, tumultuous trauma had just happened. On the road to Emmaus, they didn't know, remember, about the resurrection. So these two were no doubt in a very, very raw state. And the Bible describes them as downcast. I would say that's probably an understatement. And whilst I was preparing for this, I was reminded of when I was about five years old, and it was my first memory of facing up to the crucifixion of Jesus. At the time, there was a series on television in the UK called Jesus of Nazareth, and it was running every week up to Easter Sunday. And I don't know if anyone here remembers it, quite a few in the other meetings have remembered it. Um, we're going back over 40 years. So this is way before Netflix and streaming and devices and smartphones. This was when we only probably had three television channels, so very little choice. So as a family back then, you would all sit together and and watch the same thing. Hard to believe now, isn't it? It's quite hard. I don't know if you ever get together as a family and discuss, what what should we watch together as a family? Does anyone ever... (laughs) get to a good conclusion on that one. As as a family, we always debate and argue about what we want to watch. Anyway, this series we were watching as a household and I, I was five years old. And I have to say, probably at that age, I shouldn't have watched the climax episode of The Crucifixion because it was really graphic, brutal and honest. And in the weeks that ran up to that event... I'd seen this gorgeous portrayal of Jesus in this series, the amazing, compassionate, handsome-looking person who loved everyone, healed the sick, uh, knew what to say, the right moment, had the right answer, was zealous, was passionate, had righteous anger, incredible compassion towards and empathy with everyone, whether they were rich, poor, sinners, whether they were Jews, non-Jews, men, women, this radical man. And I knew then it was a true story and I was completely and utterly uh, sucked in. Now, we were not a church-going family. I wouldn't describe us as a, as a Christian household at the time. My mum has always been a believer. She still is. And my dad since then has got saved and we're a different family now to what we were then. But at the time, I wouldn't describe us 
as a Christian household. But the week the crucifixion happened, it was devastating for me to watch because I wasn't expecting it either. I didn't know this was coming and I was really traumatized by it. It actually gave me nightmares and I've never forgotten it and I never forget forgotten how I felt then watching this beautiful man arrested, beaten up, whipped, persecuted, hated, spat on, crucified. So this was my first memory of being told this life-changing story in the most graphic way. And it had a really big impact on me at the time. So we don't know if these two men actually witnessed uh, what happened three days before, but I think it's safe to assume that they did. It was hard to miss if you were in Jerusalem at the time. And they are certainly amazed that this stranger who's come alongside them here in the road to Emmaus, uh, they're amazed that he didn't seem to know anything about it. So to witness such a horrific death to the person that they describe as a prophet, they described him as powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. For them, it must have been extreme trauma. These were among the many who put their hope in this Jesus of Nazareth? Could this be their Messiah? Could this be the one who would liberate them from oppressive Roman rule? They put their hope in him. They trusted him. I'm sure they really loved this man who was brutally executed three days before this moment that we are looking at now today in detail. So I would say that words pretty inadequate in trying to explain what they're feeling and what they're going through. But I'm going to try and step in their shoes. So when these two men were approached on the road to Emmaus, they were probably, as I've already said, very raw. They maybe have moved on from the numbing shock to what's described in Luke as downcast, deep, deep disappointment, disillusionment, bewildered, bereft. They are looking at life without the resurrection. It's a really horrible place. And when Jesus started to talk to them, it says the men were kept from recognizing him. And depending on what commentary you read will depend on how this is interpreted. Some say that actually Satan is keeping them spiritually blind. Um, Others suggest God himself is doing so. Now, I'm not going to speculate on which one is right and which one is wrong, But I am going to say that the state that these men are in, that plays a huge part in why they can't see and recognize Jesus at this point. And disappointment has that effect. It blinds you to a lot of things. Some commentators say these two men were suffering from spiritual blindness. Also, they were going the wrong way. They were heading out of Jerusalem They were going away from all their fellow disciples who are gathered, who they're trying to piece together what's happened. Sometimes when we're disappointed, we can choose to do that. We can choose to walk away from fellowship, walk away from our church family, maybe drift for a bit. And that's something that Ron, Ron touched on last week, if you were here, when he was talking about being transformed from despair And it's hard to face family when you are dealing with deep disappointment. I mean, I found it hard to come here on a Sunday shortly after my husband went to heaven. It would have been much easier for me to not come and and not face everyone. But as Ron pointed out, these are the times when we need each other the most, actually. (laughs) And what is your instinct isn't the right course of action. And you have to overcome that temptation and choose to be with the people who are going to bless you and look after you, and give you the strength that you need. And it's clear that the disciples were acutely disappointed in Luke 24, verse 21. It says, but we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And as they talk to this stranger about what's happened, they can't help but overflow with the loss and the disbelief. They saw the cross as defeat. What is our perspective When we're disappointed, it does blur our vision like it blurred these two men. They were spiritually blind. Have we been there? Are we there now? 
In the summer this year, I went to something called New Wine, which is a big Christian event that happens every year. It's a big, um, thousands gather and there's lots of preaching and worship and seminars. And for children, there's loads of kids work. It's a, it's a great week away. It's camping, it's fellowship. It usually rains a lot and it did this year and that was massively challenging and lots of showers didn't work and oh my gosh, it's, you know, it's all of it. It's all of the above. It's very challenging. Anyway, I met this couple called Anna and Dave, a lovely couple, and I really got to know them. They're in a church in Southampton and they have a ministry where they, they run lots of preschools in the really rough uh, underdeprived areas of Southampton, quite a few preschools. And um, that's something that's a business. It's their business. It's their job. But they see it as a real ministry where they are ministering and caring to children aged, you know, naught to five before they go to school. And if you talk to any child psychologist or anyone who works in education or, you know, in any of that area, you'll know that these are the, some of the most important years in a child's life. It will set them up some say forever, in terms of their mental well-being, certainly, and in some cases their physical well-being. So they see this as a real ministry, but the reason, part of the reason why they started this ministry is because of their own personal story, and they shared the story with me, Anna in particular shared their story with me. She is a mum, and she's got three children, they're all in their 20s, and one was there, I met her at New Wine, she was serving with the young people. But they, in their early marriage, when they started to to have a family, experienced two cot deaths, a really harrowing time where they lost two babies in that way. And when they lost the first one, that was really, really tough and a real challenge for them in their faith. But for it to happen a second time, can you imagine going through that? And they have had twins, but they've also adopted Um, a child who is now, they're all in their 20s, as I say, and they're doing really, really well. But they've had a really tough journey. And Anna was talking to me and saying, because she knows I'm a widow, how do you believe God for yourself, Sally, when you've prayed so much about something and you didn't get the answer that you thought was the right one or the one you were looking for at the time? And we were discussing that together and unpacking it. And I could see that parts of Anna's world are still really locked away now deep disappointments that she's still not able to face, even though what she went through with those cot deaths was probably, you know, 20 odd years ago. But she's not able yet to allow Jesus in. And I'm praying that one day she chooses to let him in because actually it's holding her back in terms of her moving on, in terms of her faith for herself. And yet when it comes to praying for the kids in her care or you know, other people's children or, I mean, they're so passionate. They've got such a ministry and she's an absolute prayer warrior. But bits of her own story are still too hurt, hurtful for her to, to, to allow Jesus in. And Pete Gregg is a guy who recently spoke here in our church. He's a church leader and pioneer of something called the 24-7 prayer movement. You may well be familiar with it. You may be a part of it for all I know. He spoke in our church during the vision series, it was on a Wednesday night. And if you weren't here, I really encourage you to download the podcast and have a listen. It was on September the 18th because it was really powerful evening. And what he had to share was really excellent. Um, And he talked very candidly and frankly about the challenge of prayer and seeing God move in an incredible, miraculous ways. He's seen that himself many, many times where he's prayed, but also he's on the receiving end of many, many testimonies of incredible answers to prayer from all over the world. Because, of course, these are people who are part of the 24-7 prayer movement, which is a global uh, movement. And they're telling him what God's doing where they are. And yet when it comes to prayer for his wife, the experience has been very, very different. His wife was diagnosed with cancer quite early on in their marriage when they had very young children. She's been through all sorts of very tough treatment, experienced very scary health problems, seizures, very difficult traumatic times. She's on very strong medication that has a huge impact on her well-being. And he talked really frankly about walking through that and how tough it is, how sometimes it's so disappointing to face that. And yet you see and hear about God moving 
all around you, in some cases healing miraculously all around you. And I could so relate to what he was sharing that evening. And and I know many of you here can do so as well. And Pete Gregg has written many books. One is very uh, recently he's written about prayer, which I know some of you here are reading. But another one he wrote recently is called Dirty Glory. It's an excellent read. I really encourage you to get a hold of a copy. It will inspire you. It will encourage you. And in there, there's many amazing stories of what God is doing. But he also talks about his wife and what they've experienced. And this is a quote from Dirty Glory. He says, suffering is sadly inevitable in this life, but joy is not. We must therefore pursue joy relentlessly by creating space for celebration and disciplining ourselves rigorously to have fun. I love this quote and I read it often. And this advice is all over the Bible. You know, if you look at Proverbs, Psalms in particular. So Proverbs 17 verse 22 says, A cheerful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. Psalm 16 verse 11 says, You make known to me the path of life. You fill me with joy in your presence. Psalm 30 verse 11, You turned my mourning into dancing. You removed my sackcloth and you clothed me with joy. So I would slightly change what Pete Gregg says in that quote, where he says, pursue joy relentlessly. I would tweak that to pursue Jesus relentlessly. And in his presence will come the joy. It's an encounter with him. No matter what the experience is, you are having or the suffering you may be facing. It's choosing to knock on the door, being relentless about that relationship with our Saviour, not taking no for an answer, passionately seeking him, no matter what we are experiencing, no matter what our journey is. And I have to say, after Paul went to heaven, it was in June, two years ago, will be three years next June. And... um, I was a bit like my friend Anna then. I was not in a place where I could believe God for myself. I was good at praying for other people. I was good at praying in the church or whatever. But when it came to me, I would not go there because my biggest prayer for eight years had ended in a way that I did not expect. I wanted my husband to be healed and with me here, not in heaven. And it's easy, isn't it, when you're disappointed to choose not to pray because then you're not disappointed again. Isn't that right? And we limit God, don't we, by our disappointment. And in the January after the June, I was heading out on a huge trip for the BBC uh, to an event called the World Economic Forum in Davos. It's a big event where global leaders gather every year and they talk about the big issues and, and the global problems and how we can solve them. And that particular year was massive because Donald Trump, President Trump was going for the first time. He'd just been elected in the United States with a massive team from Washington. 50 heads of state were there, including Cyril Ramaphosa, who wasn't quite a head of state, but he was heading in that direction. And that's when I met him and talked to him. But Theresa May was there, our then Prime Minister. I mean, Justin Trudeau was the shining star, the new Prime Minister of Canada. So it was, it was a huge event. And for me, work-wise, it was massive. The BBC was sending me, and there was a lot of pressure on me. But also, to leave the boys, three boys, who you know recently lost their dad, um, logistically, it was a massive job to go away for seven days and have other people move in to look after them. So it was Paul's mum and dad who are amazing grandparents and who are really involved in their world all the time. And my sister was taking over at one point because it was seven days away. So they shared it out. But I had to write pages and pages of notes about school clubs and dinners and homework. And I mean, you can just imagine any parent. Um, So my mind was so busy. And the night before I was flying off, I um, was praying for my youngest son, Tom, who was seven at the time, and it was the regular nighttime prayers, which is all about Tom. And I said, Amen. And then Tom carried on and he went, And Jesus, I just pray for mummy on her trip that you look after her, that you keep her safe, that she comes home okay. And he just did this big prayer. And I 
I was really moved and, you know, holding back the tears. And I said, amen. Thank you, Tom. I gave him a big hug. And when I left his room, I thought, oh my gosh, I haven't even prayed about this. I haven't asked God to help me in this huge mammoth trip and the kids. And I realized I hadn't prayed. And it's partly because I got out of that habit. I was, I was too still disappointed to go there. And then a month later, incidentally, that trip went really well. God answered my son's prayers, which is fab. And then a month later, um, I, again, the same thing came up. I was really, really unwell. I had that one day 24 hour bug that we sometimes experience, but it was so violent and full on. It was off the scale. And I was feeling so ill. And the three boys were at school. They came home from school. And my eldest son had to be somewhere. And I couldn't figure out who could get him there. The par- I didn't know parents and blah, blah, blah. I was going to have to take him on this journey and take the other two with me because, of course, I can't leave them home alone. And I sat on the driveway and I explained to the boys and I said, look, boys, you know mummy's not very well, right? And, uh, you know, I can't be far away from a bathroom. I mean, literally, it was really bad. And I said, this trip's going to take 15 minutes there, 15 minutes back. So if I have an accident, I'm just saying, don't freak out. It's just no big deal. We just clean it up when we get home and, you know, don't go mad. And I was just sort of, you know, because I really, it was that bad. I didn't know if I'd get back in time. And my youngest son again, Tom, he just put his hand on me and he laid hands on me and he went, in the name of Jesus, make mummy well. I just rebuked this sickness. And he was off. He was just praying. (laughs) Yeah, amen. And my eldest son went, amen. And I went, amen. (laughs) And it stopped. It stopped. Because I'd already phoned work and told them I wouldn't be in the next day. It just stopped there and then. Wow. He's a little powerful prayer, that guy. Anyway, again, I was really challenged about how I was struggling to believe God for me, the disappointment that I'd experienced, how it was stopping me from believing God for me. Um, And my kids were just in such a different place to me, which was just such a blessing and so amazing. Um, Now, the two men on the road to Emmaus said after Jesus disappeared, were not our hearts burning when he was talking to us? As they spend time with him in his presence, the spiritual blindness starts to clear and they see Jesus when he broke bread with them. The deep disappointment of all that had happened is healed. They see Jesus is alive. They realize the resurrection truth. The cross for them is no longer defeat. It's a brand new, incredible revelation of the resurrection life that it means for them and for all that believe in the future. That's where the joy is, the healing, the incredible truth that all things work together for good. They basically had that revelation. He is who he said he was. He is our saviour. He is the king of kings. And so let's not, in our disappointment, make it our home. Let's not stay there. Let's not camp out at disappointment or or wear it even as a badge of honour, as some of us might be tempted to do. Let's avoid that temptation and let's relentlessly chase after that encounter with Jesus, who so wants to heal all of it and show us who he is in all these moments that we might experience. It's life-changing, a relationship that is life-changing, where the morning is turned to dancing, where we are clothed with joy. And the joy that will be our strength, that joy that's talked about in the Bible, and it's sometimes really unexplainable, the joy that he gives us as a gift when we look at what we're going through. And it's a supernatural gift at times. It's a pure joy that's hard to resist, and it spills over, overflows, and it blesses those around us. So Jesus is here. Our incredible, wonderful, loving saviour is here. So make sure you don't miss out. When I was preparing for this morning and I was thinking about sharing Anna's story, and I checked with Anna, by the way, and she's totally happy with me sharing her story today. I was 
aware, and I really felt the Spirit was saying to me, there's people here I'm gonna, who are listening to this this morning who are like Anna. And Jesus wants to come in. He's waiting patiently for you to let him in. So don't miss out. Do get your encounter, your life-changing, healing, transformative encounter. And yeah, in choose, like like those two men on the road to Emmaus who were transformed, you can too be transformed. Amen.